Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Eddie Macho Diaz of Macho Blades. I first heard of Macho a couple of years back when three of his very unique designs were licensed by Kaiser Knives, the Shark Tooth, the Butcher, and the Pry Axe. Since the release of those knives and a very special mentorship with a knife legend and a focus on his custom work has resulted in a series of dazzling fixed blades that straddle the line between menacing tactical and art knife. Macho Blades also has a very interesting inspirational origin story and i can't wait to get into it but first be sure to like comment subscribe hit the notification bell and share the show if you would and also download it to your favorite podcast app so you can listen to it if you don't finish it right here in this sitting and as always if you'd like to help support the show you can do so on patreon the quickest way to do that is to head over to the knifejunkie.com slash patreon again that's the knifejunkie.com slash patreon Hey, Macho. Welcome to the show, sir. Hey, hey. What's up, Bob? It's good to have you here. Good to have you here. I I, uh, I want to... Uh, I introduce you as Eddie Macho Diaz, but uh, like some people, I have a very good friend who goes by his nickname almost exclusively, and I know that that's the case with you. Yeah, so like close friends and family, I, growing up, it was always Macho, Macho, Macho. Um, and... Uh, you know, so I just stuck with it. My grandfather gave me that name as a kid, and it's always just been super special and just stuck with me. <laughs> That's cool. A, you could definitely have a worse nickname. And B, uh, a theme that is recurring on this show over and over and over again is that a lot of people get their first knives from their grandfather. And it's kind of cool that you got your your name, you know, and the name of your knife company from your grandfather. Very cool. Yep. Yep. He was, uh, you know, the patriarch of the family. He was like Superman in my eyes, you know? So, um, yeah, anything with him, with me. And every time I called him, he'd pick up the phone, macho man, the macho man. So I have all those <laughs> memories, um, of my grandfather. It's, and that's why I stuck with it, you know? Yeah, that's cool. So I mentioned up front that you have a pretty interesting origin story as a, as a knife maker, but also as a self-actualized man. Uh, I found it, I found it to be pretty interesting. Uh, tell us a little bit how you got into starting uh, Macho Blades. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I was um, really heavy into video games, World of Warcraft being the main one. Um, and always in those type of video games, I was always a blacksmith warrior. Right. Um, and I spent so much time. All the guys who played those games know what I'm talking about. You spent time raiding, getting up your dragon kill points and, um, you know, an expansion had came out. The first piece of armor that dropped was better than this armor that I had spent literally six to eight months to try to get. And it just hit me like, all right, this is all just for money. What am I doing? What was all that time? You know, I spent all this time making a fictional character better when I could have, you know, spent that time working on myself. And um, that kind of started a journey um, I, from there, I went into MMA. I ended up getting MMA fights, training Muay Thai, training um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, training wrestling. Um, and then after my MMA, um, you know, after MMA, I went into knife making, started watching guys like Tough Thumbs, like Gav Co, like mm -hmm. Sugar Creek Forge, and started looking at them. And I was like, man, I think I could do this. And the, the really funny story is... Um, one of the knives I had, and I had just bought it at, a, I think it was Lowe's, was a minimalist. And I just oh, thought, yeah. man, this thing's so small. I, you know, look at this little thing. I can make something like that. Turns out small knives are harder than big knives to make. <laughs> so, um, But the funny thing was that first knife, I had put it into a Facebook group, the Florida, um, a Florida knife makers group, not knowing Alan was in that group. And I said in that group, hey, I just made this knife. I modeled it after the Alan Foltz Minimalist. Let me know what you think. Lo and behold, Alan comments on it. And he's like, hey, you local in Florida, come by the shop sometime. And, you know, I found my mentor. 
like right there, just from a Facebook post. Um, and he showed me so many things. He's like on another level. I've been to many other knife maker shops. I've seen many other knife makers work. Um, this guy, like a grind on a knife, for example, you know, take me an hour and a half to do. I've watched him do a grind that looks better than that grind in five minutes. <laughs> Okay, wait, wait, wait. Uh, we'll get to Alan Foltz in a minute. Uh, oh, okay, I yeah, think, let's go back. Let's I think, back. I think we we all own an Alan Foltz or two, and man, he has been. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. The design of the minimalist is is nothing short of brilliant, but we'll get to that. Just all the hands it can fit in. But again, uh, so I think it's really interesting that you went from someone who was working really hard and spending a lot of money and time. I don't know about how much money, but obviously a lot of time in building up a fictional character. And then uh, with the release of a new edition of that, that same game, all of your time and effort was for naught. And you were literally had to start over again. And, and, you know, in the real world, when you work hard to develop yourself like that, um, only the most catastrophic things put you back to zero, heaven forbid. So uh, I think it's very interesting that you, you know, saw that, wow, I could have been spending those months on, uh, you know, on learning chokeholds and. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it was like a, it had come around the time too, that I, I started to realize like in my professional life. So by day I'm a network security engineer, right? I, hook up firewalls, do all the configuration. And I'm into, you know, IT world. And I realized anything I spent my time on, I do get better in. I have a niche. I can, you know, pick things up quickly. And whatever I spend my time on, I know I can get better at. And um, that realization, and then the other side of that was like, man, I wonder how good I could actually get at knife making, you know, not just playing one, like how good can I get? Can I become a master one day? Um, and yeah, that just so was, started off the journey. Was your interest in weapons, uh, and knives specifically, was that cultivated by the gaming or was that something that was always in you? Oh yeah. That's, that's always, you know, like most kids, right? He-Man, <laughs> Conan, yeah. you know, they always seem to have, um, a weapon, some type of legendary weapon, right? Even sword in the stone, like all these different things. And it was always so interesting to me, too, because, you know, it was almost like the maker gave a part of his soul and this this one specific special time and came up with this weapon. And I thought that was like so interesting, you know, just to see that in lore and mythology as you're watching movies and growing up. So I was always into, you know, knives and drawing knives and um, like any little boy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, that's not something you should ever lose. And obviously, you've turned your life into it, which is awesome. But I still doodle in, in every uh, in every margin, you know, I'm drawing <laughs> knives. But you talk about that sort of um, uh, uh, instilling your soul into a knife you're making. It's kind of like, uh, you know, you see that at the beginning of Conan the Barbarian mentioned you, uh, a movie you mentioned, which was hugely formative uh, for me. I just always love that movie. You know, the first one. And in the beginning, yes, you know, they didn't really cast swords like that. But that whole scene with the father making that sword that ends up being the sword that he cuts off Thulsa Doom's head with in the end. Uh, there's a real story that goes into that blade in the World of Warcraft. And you're talking to a I'm not even a noob, never played it. Uh, and um, I just don't you know, it's not part of my world in that world. Are the weapons the same way? Are they instilled with? powers and um souls yeah well that's that was one of the things so in the game you could be a blacksmith right which was general you can make swords and armor mm -hmm. but at once you got to a certain level you had to choose a path you had to choose the path of the weaponsmith or the armor smith and to do that you had to go on this crazy you know quest multiple continents finding mentors finding special materials um so it was kind of like that, you know? So, okay, you, you uh, by profession, uh, your day job, you work, as you said, in IT, security, um, real virtual kind of stuff. And then your passion and your, and your business, your business is something that's very tangible, very real world. What, what's that switch like going from, I mean, on the daily basis, but also I know now you're, you're, a, you're 
working as a full-time knife maker and maybe in addition to a, another full-time career um uh, what is it like throwing that switch and and what was it like going how where how, how did you have the physical skills to do knife making yeah and this was just repetition like practice that was one of the things alan taught me he's like you know um the first thing he did with that first knife i brought over there he said um you, you did really good. What was the equipment you used to make this? I told him the equipment and he said, your equipment's holding you back, not your skills. Um, I see you have some skills for this. He's like, get some good equipment, make it happen. And I was like, all right. I took out my 401k. I bought a real knife maker, shout out to KMG, but Beaumont Metalworks. Um, I bought my first official knife maker, you know, started racking up all these tools. And sure enough, I started seeing my um, you know, practicing on that good equipment, my skills getting better. So. so, so with the, with the equipment you had before the kind of just regular stuff you might have in your garage, uh, how going from the old grinder to the new grinder, what was the, what was the difference? Oh, it's like night and day. So the first grinder was a one by 30 from Harbor Freight. That was like 40 bucks right? No variable speed. It's one speed. It's wobbly. Um, not that powerful. You know, it was, it was, uh, something else. And then from, to go from that to a variable speed KMG with multiple, you know, I had a flat plat and I had a, um, an eight inch wheel, 14 inch wheel. So just way more options and way more things you can do uh, with the right tools, you know? And like, again, it was night and day for things as simple as a uh, variable speed, right? It's something you learn along the way. While you want the high speed, right, for hawking off material, once you start getting up in grit 400, 600, you actually want to slow that thing way down, right? Uh, and you, you can't do that on those cheaper grinders. Um, and once you do that, you start to see that nice finish come across. So it was just one of those things. And to your other point, like you said, my, my day job was all virtual all the time. And to go to this, it, it did, it gave me a different sense of joy, right? If you're a firewall engineer or any kind of IT work, you know, you get called when things are broken. It's like a no thankful job, like, hey, hey, it's broken, fix it. And after you fix it, nothing again, you know? They're like, get out of my office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get out of here. Make sure it doesn't break again. And um, with the knife making, it was different, right? I went to Blade Show and I saw all these different artisans and craftsmen from all over the world come down and um, you know, I saw the first time like a kid picked up one of my knives and was like, this is the coolest thing. Dad, dad, look, I want it, blah, blah. I mean, I was like cooked. Like it was like one of my first sales. I was like, all right, I got to get better. Like being able to inspire and, you know, I don't know, bring joy and even to build something that I know is useful to somebody else, you know, and that's going to be here long after I'm gone. I think that's really cool. That is, uh, man, that's, that's the thing I hear a lot of knife makers talk about is the, the, the legacy of each piece they make, knowing what it's made out of and how durable those materials are. And then you add in your own build and your, the faith you put in your own build, you know that that knife is going to be kicking it somewhere for way longer than, than any of us can, can keep track with it, keep up with it. I think that's a, a really cool thought, you know, putting that out into the world. Yeah. And it's just, you know, that, that little bit of legacy and, you know, like an honors pursuit, you know, like I'm, I'm legitimately trying to be the best knife, or knife maker I can be. I'm sacrificing, you know, time, like you said, putting blood, sweat and tears into these things, uh, probably sacrificing some of my health as well. Right. Mm. A, a lot of these handle materials, this metal, it's not, uh, it's not good for you. Uh, even with masks on and stuff, right. I got a beard. So that, you can't seal all the time, but it's, you know, for me, it's worth it, you know, like, um, being able to have that, have that legacy, put all my effort into one thing and see how far I can take it. And, you know, anyway. And, and you're a part of a continuum that goes back to the beginning of civilization or before the beginning of civilization, when we were monkeys making tools, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. They say the knife was one of the first tools, right? There's yeah. something ancient there right our first tool and uh that's why i've always been you know i was scared of knives right your first knife you get cut now you're scared and then so there's always been this this thing with that but it's um i don't know it's like nothing else and that's why i enjoy doing it and 
Um, it's also a craft that you can, you know, I have a, a bunch of really cool friends that I met in the knife making community where we all make each other better. We all, it's like a whole different community you enter and uh, it's been pretty, pretty awesome so far. So you, you work on the oldest tool, you do your modern interpretation um, of what is the oldest tool. And uh, for the, your period of time working in the U.S. Air Force, uh, you were fixing our newest, one of our newest tools, you know, F-16 uh, Fighting Falcon. Is that what it's called? The Fighting Falcon? Yeah. Actually, the F-16 was made in the 70s. But the, um, wow. yeah, it, it's still a great air to ground jet. Uh, the new one that replaced it, I believe, is the F-35. Um, but, yeah, I mean, still, the it's if you look at those things and what they're capable still of, the F-16 is an amazing fighter jet. So how do you think uh, working on F-16s um, fed your, your knife making? Man, that fed my knife making. It fed my, um, my IT job, right? Like, we learned how to troubleshoot, the, you know, a $20 million jet, right, with – somebody's life at stake, you know, like everything's high, highly critical missions. You got to make sure everything's, <clears throat> excuse me, good. And the, the troubleshooting techniques that they showed me, it's just how to solve problems. And in knife making that that's all it really is, right? You, you start making a knife, you run into one problem. You're like, all right, how do I solve this problem? And uh, I think it's helped me in that way. So let's, let's talk about your, um, your, licensed designs with kaiser where did they fall okay so you you meet alan fultz how, how does the timing work here you get this this kaiser deal with the shark tooth i know we all remember the shark tooth and the butcher as well the one that i couldn't remember was the priax but i remember when that came out because we talked about it on on our wednesday oh, okay. show and nice. um yeah it was like one of the one of the first pry tools where i, where I thought hmm, that's kind of cool because i just never have to pry much you know and so it wasn't on my radar but so how did you get involved with kaiser um as a new maker right so actually i got the kaiser deal after meeting alan it okay. was probably two or three years after meeting alan um you know again helping me refine those skills uh, one of the things Alan had told me uh, was, you know, because I've been to Blade Show since like 2015, 2014. I've been going to Blade Show every year right next to Alan's table. Um, the first year I went, I ended up setting up my table right before everybody came, you know, and it was just madness. And he was like, don't do that. Like, get here early, set up your table because there's knife companies, other vendors around looking at maker stuff. He's like, that's how I got my deal. Um, you know, people saw my stuff, you know, you want to be here early, you want to set everything up and let those different vendors see your stuff. And sure enough, the next year I set up, um, one of the guys, uh, David's son from Kaiser at the time, mm -hmm. he, uh, was walking around and he saw my butcher and he was like, Hey, I really like this. And the butcher and the Priax, he signed them right there. He said, Hey, I want to, I want to work with you on these. Would you be willing to? And I said, yeah. And so he sent over paperwork um, and we started that process. And then the shark tooth, shark tooth came after. That was another design. And then David hit me up and was like, hey, I just saw this on Instagram. We want this too. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. Um, but yeah, again, it was back to that advice, you know, and it was at Blade Show. So all you young knife makers out there, yeah, if you're at Blade Show and you're presenting, get there early, way before anybody's coming in, set up and you know, meet and greet, rub elbows with everybody. That's the greatest part about Blade Show is, is the people. It's the, it's the big cliche, but it's true, you know. And for a knife maker, it's it's absolutely critical, especially that first day um, or, or the, the day before, you know, during setup, during the end of setup. And people are milling around. They're checking out each other's work. Everyone's kind of relaxed at that point. Right. And, uh, and don't forget, there are a lot of heavy hitters in the room who do a lot of licensing. So, yep. um, the butcher is, is cool. It, you can, you can almost tell when that, uh, that's about three years old at this point, right? Or two years old. Yeah. It's a few years old now. Um, it, that it, was the first one I did with them. It came at, at a perfect time because the cleaver, um, the cleaver trend was cresting and people's love of cleavers was really at the fore, you know, in both folders and then, 
And then Kaiser starts moving into more fixed blades, which I love seeing. I love fixed blades as well. And uh, so to see uh, see that come out is cool. And it's a very dramatic, it looks like something almost, uh, well, tell us about the design inspiration of the Butcher. And if you have one close yeah, to I here, got one can I'm, show. I was working on here. I will oh, show you cool. some different stages. Yeah, so this is one I'm working on. You can see I just did all the carving, you know, to it. Still a plain blade. Here goes one I finished up. Yeah, so just like you said, it was um, right around that cleaver, for, you know, craze. I wanted to, um, yeah, figure out how, you know, how I do my own cleaver. Going back to Alan's stuff, the the my favorite part about Alan's knives is, you know, the comfort, the grip. They're mm -hmm. just so comfortable. And so I wanted to try to come up with a nice, small, comfortable cleaver design. And this one, you know, it's evolved a little bit over the years. I've refined it, but um, this is what popped out. <laughs> that is cool. I love how the blade continues under the forefinger and halfway um, under the bird finger, whatever that's called, middle finger. Uh, I like that because it's an extension of the whole blade across you know across those two fingers and yet it doesn't make it too long because that's the thing with um everyday carry fixed blade knives for me they have to fall within a certain overall length for me to carry i carry one every day but but it i tend to carry the smaller ones more and the smaller you can go with a more cutting edge like that that's pretty that's pretty cool and that was another thing was kind of play on my name right macho people here like macho blades they would think some giant knife and i was coming out with all these like small like this is one of my thunderbird blanks you know small little knives here goes a shark tooth blank oh cool and um yeah it was just a play on the name you know so uh the the um the thunderbird which you held up is really i i got to say that until i just saw the predator that you just put up that was that was my my favorite. But before we get to that in particular, you mentioned carving. You held up one of the um, butchers at, at a post carving phase. Hold that up again, yeah. if you would. And tell us what you're talking about when you're talking about carving. Right. So if you look here on these. Um, one of the things that I started playing with and, you know, started kind of getting my style on the knives and, and my design style was what to do with all the flat space space, right? You grind these bevels and then what do you do with all this flat space? And so these carvings, this is me with a Dremel tool and a cutoff wheel and actually, you know, carve these lines all into the blade here. You can see the, yeah. all onto the flats just to give those the flat or the relief area, something else, you know, I saw the knives. It was just blank right there. And me, I like drawing on everything, like you said, on every piece of paper, right? So it was like every edge of the paper is filled with my drawings. And that's what I was doing. I was filling that blank area in. Um, and this took a while to get, you know, doing it with a Dremel. A lot of people think I use a mill to do yeah. this stuff, um, but I don't. This is all by hand with the Dremel. A lot of mess ups, cursing and screaming at the top of my legs <laughs> in the shop. But um, I've gotten pretty steady with it now, so I could do things like that, carving, like the, uh, I'll show you the, uh, this is that predator you saw today. Oh, so my right, God. Right here, all that, I don't know if you can see it because the screen, but yeah, see all this carving right here, the lines? Yes. Yes. It, it, if, if you can't really see it, there, it looks like there's an acid wash or a stone wash on the flat, and then it's... Uh, uh, not on the flat, on the bevel, and then the flat is is satin, and the delineating line is is carved out. Uh, that knife, you got to hold that back up. I mean, yeah, that yeah. is really wicked. Yeah. So, what is, is this? A new one? Is this a? Is this the first of a of a series, or or what? Yeah. So going back to uh, my love of knives, one of my favorite movies uh, was the first Predator, right? Yes. And I believe it was Tommy. When he went to at the end Billy. there fight against Billy. the predator, Billy, and he <laughs> he took that knife across his chest. He had that giant knife. I thought it was one of the coolest knives. I was like, oh, what is that thing? Um, and so that's why I named this one the Predator. Just playing off that names, playing off things I like like that, and then I actually put the uh, the Predator symbol right there where oh, you yeah. know, his first alien kill. You get a nice Predator symbol. So. <laughs> 
That is so cool. I love that knife, man. I, I think you need to make multiples of that. Um, but that's just me. That's the kind of knife I love, man. Yeah, and this is this is like my first fighter, you know, trying different things. I've never done hidden tang before. Mm -hmm. So I always stood away from fighters because, you know, they have these really cool um, bolsters. And I didn't really know how it would look on a full tang knife because that's kind of, you know, what I do or what I know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just like the way this came out. This one came out pretty, pretty dang good. And at some point I will be, you know, going into hidden tang. But I think this one uh, came out pretty cool. I think um, I think people uh, do not expect a hidden tang. Um, I think a lot of people love the surety of a full tang. And to me, if it looks like a, a hidden tang like yours does, but is full tang, that's even that's even better. So on that knife, I think you have some of this. And on a number of the Thunderbirds I've seen, it's not just line. It's not just incising lines into the surface. It looks like you're doing some carving or some jigging. What What's going on there? Yeah, so that's with the same exact um cutting tool on the dremel so basically i cut out that line on the flats and then very carefully i don't know if you're gonna be able to pick this up you can kind of see them dancing in the light that little uh, yes yes yeah so that is just very carefully i you know do rows of just barely touching it with that cutoff wheel and then after that because what actually started happening i i did that and i left that finish and it would rust right away because mm. it was kind of like a rough finish from that cutting wheel. So then I put um, flits and different polishes and really um, polished that area after I do the cuts. And that's why it kind of shines like that. And it's like a high polish. So, so it's just a process I was playing with, you know. You don't see too much of this um, because it seems like it's time consuming. And and it seems like there's a lot uh, in the balance. You could you could you know sneeze with that dremel in your hand and mess up an entire blank um what what is it that moves you about this that that uh, gets you to i mean it's kind of a creative risk is that the thrill yeah i think so it's like that one foot in order one foot in chaos you mm -hmm. know and that's yeah. like uh two opposing forces right that's how you get something very accurate um and that's it that's like you said it keeps it exciting it also set me apart i think right? Obtaining that skill, being able to do those type of things and really trying to cultivate my style, you know, trying to find my niche and my style. Cause like, you, as you know, there's a bunch of knife makers that make really awesome knives and, you know, just trying to get above that noise, uh, you know, floor and show people my stuff, you know? I, to me, the idea of it not being done with a mill and being done but these marks, it's like mark making in, in art, you know, they're being made by hand. And um, I actually have not picked up your work and checked it out in person yet, but I will in a couple of months, God willing. And uh, um, but I would imagine that being able to see that it's done by hand is another part of why people collect your knives, because you're seeing the maker's hand there. I mean, you could you could pick up any number of custom knives and not really see the maker's hand, so to speak. Yeah. And, um, you know, CNC's are great. I have a mill, a manual mill, and I plan on doing a bunch of stuff with that, but there is something about doing things by hand, right? Getting that feel. It's not going to be perfect. Um, every, like a CNC will do it perfect, but that kind of loses the soul of it a little bit. I feel too, right. There's happy accidents sometimes that happen yeah. that you go, wow, that's, that's actually better than I thought. I'm, I'm going to do it this way from now on. So there's things you find, uh, you know, when you go that route. So the, the shark tooth, um, we just passed one and I'm sure we'll see another one here shortly, but uh, the shark's tooth is an interesting one to me because when I first saw it, I was like, Oh, that's cute. Like that's a, um, you know, it, it's a character. It kind of reminds me of some other, um, what is it? Oh, like some bottle openers, like Vox made a snail bottle opener. Like you see throughout throughout the knife world, um, animals emulated through through blade design. Uh, and at first, it struck me as cute, and then I saw it in your grip or someone else's grip, and I thought, wait a sec, this is something else too. This is more yeah. like that the 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 little kitty cat brass knuckles I got from my daughters. You know, yeah, let me see exactly. that exactly. Yeah, so it, it was just one of those things where you can, 
you know, you could pull this out and nobody's going to freak out. You know, they're like, oh, that's a cute knife. Um, so it, it's a conversation starter. It's not going to alarm, you know, anybody who's freaking out that you have a knife. Uh, but actually, you know, this can serve you very well in a fight, you know, even different things, you know, different grips we have here, the reverse grip, very comfortable grip. And um, yeah, it could, it can do a lot of damage <laughs> in the right hands. Yeah. It's like, it's like a sneaky, sneaky weapon. You know, it's been, you sort of snuck it in under the radar, but um, so that, that seems like a great sort of all purpose knife to give someone because if they're not knife people, they're not going to be freaked out, but if they are knife people or just whatever, they're in a, they're in any sort of a pinch, uh, who knows that could, that could help. And how humiliating to get shanked by a cute knife. <laughs> baby shark. Yeah. Okay, baby shark. And the cool thing was, right. So I started selling these, um, and the price point was $300, right. Which for a custom knife, you know, I didn't think was crazy, but yeah. you know, I, I was running into a lot of people's like, oh, I love that knife. I wish I could afford it. And that was the great thing about the Kaiser deal, right? You can get this knife for 50 bucks. Uh, here goes one of the Kaisers, you know, unit, unidirectional carbon fiber, black stone wash, 50 bucks. That's cool. You know? Yeah. Uh, one of the other cool things with Kaiser that they've allowed me to do is with my designs, get exclusives for my website. So like for the shark, I, I did this one with them where we did um, marble carbon fiber, titanium screws and liners. You can see here, I have them anodized teal yeah. and they're numbered, right? So there was like a limited edition. So Kaiser's been pretty awesome to work with. They allow me to do these exclusives and then get these out to as many people as possible, you know, at an affordable price. Yeah, that is definitely... Uh, has been a revolution, you know, the Kaisers, the uh, best techs and Riots, et cetera, et cetera, who've been, uh, you know, these Chinese manufacturers who are just creating amazing work and making it possible for people. You know, there, there might be a lot of people out there who can afford a macho knife, a macho blade or all of them, but they're probably not collecting a whole bunch of other stuff too. So if you're um, someone who has a wide ranging eye for knives those companies make it great because you can get your feet wet with a designer um and then you know have the work from a whole bunch of different designers but you could really focus i'm going to start getting macho blades right from macho himself you know uh, but it's that exposure that's really important exactly yeah and like i said it was um you know one of those things that it just got my name out there and started, you know, people asking and people looking into my designs more. And it, it, it really helped. And, and I feel like I got lucky, right? Cause I, I got that deal. I was only making knives maybe four or five years, something like that. Nice. So it was, um, it was one of those things where it just came out of nowhere and I was like, Whoa. Um, and it's, it's been awesome now with the, I don't have the folder here. No, I, I did that, but now I'm on the rampage. <laughs> to try to get another deal somewhere else, right? Continue my design work, right? After the the butcher, the shark tooth, the Pryax, I feel like I, I kind of just started making those and there wasn't enough time to try things, mm -hmm. right? I just started, all right, now you gotta make, you know, a bunch of butchers or now you got, you know, sharks. So this past year, I've really been, like you saw with the Predator, with, um, here goes one of my other bigger models. This is the Huntsman. But oh, trying man. some bigger knives, you know? That's beautiful. Yeah, that is a really nice looking knife, the Huntsman. And I noticed, well, you, uh, you're, we're seeing all the same sculpting, <laughs> uh, that intaglio sculpting, and we're seeing the uh, beautiful handles and handle work. Uh, that's what I was saying in my intro when I was saying they're, they're, they're dazzling but still menacing because they have an aspect of that, of that design. With you... Oh, uh, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I was going to ask you something else. Finish what you're going to say. I was going to say you actually brought something up that um, I wanted to say. That's actually kind of like exactly what I'm trying to do. Like uh, you said, they kind of look like art knives, but then they're menacing. And yeah. that's what I wanted. Like I love once I found art knives and I saw some of these masters who, you know, just make beautiful, beautiful pieces. Um, 
I thought I would walk, look at them and go, oh, I, I would love to get that knife, but I would never use it. I, I, I wouldn't want to mess it up. <laughs> you know, right. it's like so beautiful. So with my designs, I was like, I want to make art knives that you could use, right? The price isn't so crazy. You know, I'm not charging thousands of dollars. Um, good steels, good heat treatment, fun designs, uh, art designs that can actually be useful and that you could beat up and do everything to. So that's like one of my design goals. So I want to ask you about uh, about the Thunderbird. You were holding up a blank of it. I'm not sure if you have a finished version, but this knife to me is, uh, I mean, it's so, so up my alley. It's a, it's a uh, kind of a sub hilt and yeah, yeah. it is a um, uh, really nice worn cliff and it's a very broad blade. So something tells me very slicey. Um, tell me about the birth of this knife and, and its popularity. I'm presuming it's a pretty popular one of your models. Um, yeah. So I actually just did the, these first Thunderbirds that you're seeing, these are the first Thunderbirds I made. I think I've only made around seven or eight of them so far. Uh, and you did a run, you're doing a run of 20. Is that right? Yep. And then okay. uh, for Blade Show coming up here, um, the design came from a couple different things. Uh, Blade Show last year, you know, I didn't have the best show. You know, I, I was still make, you know, doing my thing, but I still felt like I need something else, something new. Again, I hadn't been trying all this stuff. Um, and Alan had told me, he said, well, you know, you just need to get one model, focus on it, refine it as much as you can. Uh, and, you know, blow it out next year, get people excited for it, you know, and so that's what we did. I started drawing stuff up. A lot of the inspiration came from from different things, like uh, one of them for sure was Jose de Braga, if you know who that is. Mm. He's an old school, old school knife maker. I only heard of him through Alan, right? So okay. it was actually one of Alan's favorite knife makers. And I was like, who are you talking about? And then he showed me this little slip joint folder that he had from Jose de Braga. And it was probably the coolest knife I've ever seen. And wow. Jose de Braga was actually a jeweler before he was a knife maker. Uh -huh. So he has all these little details everywhere throughout the knife. I mean, like um, on the Thunderbird, you see I have that extended um, finger choil. Mm -hmm. Part of that was looking at the Jose de Braga folders. His folders, you could sit on the table and they would stand like this because their finger guard was out. And I thought that was so cool. It looked like a plane ready to fly off or something. So – yeah, I started riffing off of that. Um, again, the small EDC design, right? I want something that you'll use every day that's small enough, um, super tough. The worn cliff blade shape came be for a few reasons. One, just ease of uh, use and grinding, right? So I'm grinding a straight bevel, right? So I wanted to practice my grinding because, uh, like I told you, I've seen Alan grind something in five minutes and it's done. And me, it takes two hours. So I'm like, how do you get that good? He's like, you just got to put the time in. So I was like, all right, I'm just getting a whole bunch of these water jetted and I'm just going to be at that grinder all day. So they hit so many different roles for me. The other good thing about the Warncliffe blade shape is if you look at even self-defense knives, if you look at any like martial blade designs, it goes back to this uh, Warncliffe. The Warncliffe, it's, uh, if you just look it up, like the way it cuts, how deep it penetrates, when it penetrates, it pops back out because of, you know, the, I'm sorry, the way the blade is shaped. So you can look at all these different things as far as self-defense goes as well. And the worn cliff is a, a great blade shape. So I kind of put all those things together and started having fun with it. And I think I got something special, you know, like I've liked every single one of them that's come out and I want to, uh, I have some really cool ideas too for the next couple ones. Yeah, it seems like um, in the in the current era of just looking from afar, it seems to be uh, a signature knife for you. Just maybe because I've seen the most of those uh, than anything else, and they just they seem fully actualized. They seem fully like you know exactly what each one of those is all about. And and I love the Warncliffe blade, uh, one of my favorites. I love. Um, tactical and self-defense knives and implements and i'm fully on board with how effective warren cliffs are just just simply due to the fact that on a swipe or a slash which is what i'm most likely to do you don't have the the point 
glancing away or, or shying away from the material. It's digging ever deeper. But at the same time, it's the most it's a very, very useful blade shape. I was just doing a project with my daughter and cutting out this. This is all the time cutting out, uh, you know, paper things to put on the poster that's going to school instead right. of with scissors and having it all janky. I'm teaching her how to use a uh, a Warncliffe because it's kind of like a, a nice exacto blade hanging around. Exactly. You know? Exactly. It's, that's exactly what it is. It's like a giant razor blade. And uh, these Thunderbirds, I do a hollow grind on them. So I do a 14, mm. 14 inch wheel hollow grind and they're basically razors. They're so sharp, you know, and that harpoon. So I do an aggressive harpoon shape too. So really at the end, the geometry is actually like a diamond punch. You know, it's got the grind on four sides coming to that one point. That's I love it. I, I'm sold. And I love the um, the the finger groove is so extreme on the tail end that it, it is like a sub hilt. And I, I love that for you were talking about extraction. I love that for that purpose. Not that I'm getting in knife duels and have actually <laughs> needed it. But, you know, I like I like knowing it's there. Um, so let's talk about Alan Foltz. I, I, I didn't mean to uh, keep pushing him off, but I wanted to find out a little bit more about you um before talking about him he's you know a legend i've i've owned many and gifted many minimalists and a spew here and there and uh you know th those are just the um the knives of his that are within reach for me but um man he he nailed it with the minimalist i have put that in in the hands of i have medium-sized hands my daughters who have small hands fits them great uh, guys I work with who are immense fits their hands. Great. Something he just hit a magical mean with that. Yeah. I mean, I, just like you, the first time I held one of those minimalists, I said, Whoa, this thing looks funky. At first I thought they were ugly. I said, what's this little ugly knife? Let me check it out. And it just fit like a glove. And I was like, Ooh, I, I like this. You know, um, I don't know if you remember nothing fancy back in the day. Sure. Oh yeah. But he would say there's first kind of cool and second kind of cool. Yeah. Um, and that one definitely has the first kind of cool, you know, it, it's very utilitarian when you feel it right away, it's super light. It can fit anywhere. It just hits so many of that first kind of cool. Um, and then they started growing on me and I started collecting them myself. I got a couple of little faults. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, so I had that one for a short time and then I gifted it to someone who I thought needed it. Unfortunately. Oh, that's a sweet one. I haven't gotten that one yet. Oh yeah, this is the katana list with, and he actually has a homone on there. Oh. So this is obviously a custom or one of his, yes. Yeah, yeah, this is yeah. a custom, and so is this. This is actually a custom as well. The Caraman. So uh, how, how? So he invited you over after you posted a uh, a shot of a knife you were working on that was kind of inspired by it. He invites you over, and, and then it kind of takes you under his wing, right? I mean, how did how did that happen? Yeah, I mean, I went over there and was like, yeah, like just started asking so many questions like, oh, man, that's so awesome. What about this? This is what I'm working on. What should I do here? And just really trying to soak up the knowledge. And anybody who's talked to Alan knows like he just gives that knowledge freely. I had actually tried to call a bunch of different knife makers here in Florida to just see if I could come over to their shop or something. Right. I was trying to learn. I was trying to find something. And all those guys I reached out to, I, I had people just tell me straight up no. You know, or like, no, I, I don't do that. Or Alan invited me right in and right away started just giving all the knowledge free. I mean, it would have took me years of messing up and figuring stuff out to get to where I'm at. You know, and that's just off stuff he showed me. And I was like, whoa, just different processes he had. Even stuff simple like um, you can see this butcher that I'm working on. You see those brass inserts? Yeah. So that's one of his techniques that he showed me, right? I was trying to figure out, I was just doing uh, pinning the knives and I was using like pivot barrels. He's like, why are you doing that? That's so much money. He's like, you just knock some brass in the hole, sand it flat, drill and tap the brass. You have your own insert and it costs you like five cents. Wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let me give that a shot. And now that's how I do like all my knives. Um, just little things like that. Uh, and with any master, right? He had been doing it. I think he's been doing it 25 years or something like that. Just so many years of 
um, making processes better. Like I, I was able to soak in all that knowledge and um, yeah, he's been great, a great teacher, a great mentor, a great friend. Man, you could not have asked for a better, a better response. You know, you, you, you reach out to a bunch of people that don't hear anything back and you hear back from Alan Fultz. It's kind of like, <laughs> yeah. it makes, makes the seeking worthwhile. So he's, I, I watched, uh, so uh, the video of you in his shop, uh, this afternoon and man, his shop looks beautiful, really well organized. I, I, yeah, uh, Man, I, I admire people who always keep their stuff. I can organize, and then it's a downhill slope until I organize the next time. You know what I mean? I'm he's, with you. <laughs> <laughs> he's one of these guys whose shop looks like a, you know, a uh, an operating room or something like that. Um, what kind of things? Has, I know he's taught you techniques and things, but like in terms of design and and things that maybe might be on the more philosophical side of knife making. What kind of things has he taught you there? Uh, design a bunch of things like and he's always reminded me you know i'll send him a new drawing he's like oh those lines are are meeting in, in a good design you don't want lines meeting people's eyes are going to go there try this uh, or maybe think of it this way and um so just on just basic design work he's helped me a bunch just on that and as far as like the philosophical stuff and really teaching me how i'm going to become better right? What I should do to become better. Uh, seeing those different things, even that he does, there's a lot of stuff he teaches me just by doing it. And I'm watching him, what mm -hmm. he's doing, how his processes are. Um, so yeah. And then his shop, like you said, it's every time I go to his shop, it's a new process. I, I make jokes with him all the time. I'm like, so what, what revision are we on for shop for Alan's shop, you know, rules like revision 34, this new process He's always refining his processes, always adding new things, always upgrading. I mean, last time I went to a shop, he was 3D printing covers for his drill presses on the bottom so that when he's uh, drilling holes, the material doesn't fall under his drill press. And then on that piece, little individual parts for all his different drill bits. Well, <laughs> you know me, I would just throw yeah. the drill bits in the drawer and that's it. <laughs> yeah he's just on on another level of efficiency in his shop too like seeing like the the back wall here the top corner he'll put like pvc pipe up there and all his long brass rods he puts in there so it's like up and away and he knows exactly where it's at um i've never seen anybody else build their shop or have such an efficient shop like that it's, it's been pretty interesting you know to watch and to learn from him so what uh aspects of how he is as a knife maker um, are you, uh, assimilating? I, I guess it's not the organization part. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm just no de definitely not. <laughs> um, there's so many ways where me and him are totally different, you know? Um, but that's the great part. Uh, so there's a, a bunch of the stuff in the, the knife designs. Um, one of the things that I noticed again, is that first kind of cool in his designs, right? They're very ergonomic. They're very utilitarian. They're very purpose driven, you know, like, uh, so I'm trying to take that aspect and then mix it with my own stuff, you know, where my stuff has been more like fun, uh, you know, funny, funky knives. I like funky stuff, but I still try to, you know, like my handles, they got to feel a certain way. I want them to melt into your hand. I want it to have that ergonomic shape, um, the blade shape, you know, how thin I grind my, my bevels, right. I usually grind my bevels up to about 10 thousandths of an inch. And again, that's something Alan told me, you know, when I remember when I was first having troubles like sharpening and I'm like, man, these won't sharpen. He's like, how thin are you grinding the bevels? And I was like, uh, till they look pretty thin. I don't know. I don't measure that. And he's like, you, you got to measure that and make sure it's even all the way across and try to get to around 10 to 15 thousandths at the edge. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know? Well, those are numbers that uh, the current, you know, knife community loves. I mean, that super thin behind the edge, slicey edge is, you know, man, you cannot lose with that. I think the days of sharpened pry bars are um, over, except except in certain examples where uh, it's on purpose and it's for a, a wound making reason or, you know, something, something specific job oriented. But right. on, the, on the whole, people want knives that cut. You know, not so much knives that pry. They go to pry bars for 
for that. Right. Um, yep. Yep. So, yeah, so it, it, I'm sorry. Ahead. No, no, no. Uh, no, that, that's all I was going to say. So I'll go okay. Can move on. Well, I was going to, I was going to ask about future designs and, and how you, how you approach them and how you plan on approaching them from a business standpoint, because you've got, uh, like to me, the Thunderbird just seems like a natural winner to me uh, because of the ergonomics, the opportunity to express yourself uh, that people love on the blade itself and with the handle materials and the super usefulness of a hollow ground, thinly ground Warncliffe blade. To me, that seems like a, a, a slam dunk. Um, and then and then you have some like more playful things like the butcher and the shark tooth. And 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 the hunts and then you have the huntsman, which really seems like the kind of knife uh, an outdoorsman would would go for, you know, um, in, in terms of fancy outdoorsman uh, sort of. But so and then this predator, you where do you plan on? Um, so do you want to be one of these guys who refines a couple of designs or do you want to make a bunch of designs? Right. So um, a couple of things. So where am I going to go with the designs? And, and this is something else you talked about, right? So full-time maker. Um, on the firewall side, on my day job, I actually own my business too, right? So I'm a consultant and I do that for different customers. And But I'm still making knives and working on knives every day. And that's a sacrifice for me. I could make a lot more money if I just worked on firewalls all day, right? And what I'm trying to do is to figure out how do I make knife making to where it can provide for my family like a reality and so that's why this year i've been trying all these new designs because i want to you know up until then my designs like you said they were fun you know i have funky little designs and um i wanted to expand i wanted to try new things hit different areas um the predator was one of the first ones where i wanted that i wanted to try a couple different things i wanted to try a fighting knife that one and a dagger. Those are going to be my fighting knives. I want to get out there. I want to get some kitchen knives out there. Um, I've been making knives so long. I never made a kitchen knife, mm -hmm. you know, again, utilitarian. I want to get that under my belt. Um, I also wanted to dive into the folders. I, I recently just did my first folder. Um, and there's a video of that on my Instagram. You guys could check that out. And again, just diving into these different designs, making knives that are purpose driven, that have, you know, utility, utility to them, but they're also, you know, good looking, unique knives where you feel you have something special. And I feel that if uh, this sacrifice I'm making by working on these knives, by doing this every day, by refining designs and getting all these designs out there, that one of them will hit, you know, and either I'll get another deal or get more orders and really keep this whole thing going, you know. Yeah, I love it. I, that to me, that's you're in a, a you're in a special place right now because you you're not desperate. You have a business already humming along uh, that can put bread on the table, and it's a it's this is a period of time. And my God, you you've got an amazing mentor. Uh, but aside from that, you are who you are, and and you've already got your own knife making career in your own right. And this is a great time for you to sow your oats and figure out you know, and do things like the predator and see how it goes, because I'm sure you're getting tremendous feedback on that. Um, yeah. Everybody seems to like it so far. So I'm getting, and people are saying like, finally, you made a big knife. I, I want this one so bad. You know, people like the big uh, crazy knives. So uh, yeah. And like you said, I'm in that special place where uh, again, it's, it's that order. Uh, I got a foot in order, you know, and a foot in chaos and, it's just one of those things I didn't want to look back on my life and say, I should have tried it. You know, I should have just tried to see how far I can take that. Right. The dream is to um, fulfill my purpose, whatever that is. Right. Whatever's in me, whatever skills I have to fulfill those and actualize those 100 percent and see where that takes me. Right. Um, and knives has just always been it. It's always just been calling to me. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make me as much money as firewalls. But um, I'm here. I'll tell you what, though, it's a lot more interesting at parties to talk about that than firewalls, <laughs> no doubt. Even though I'm sure firewalls is a fantastic business, I'm sure you're great at it. But um, yeah, so um, in terms of your family, have they, um, besides the support that they give you um, as father, husband, etc., 
is there interest in knives from your family and um, being a part of your um, knife making voyage? Yeah. Yeah. So um, my two little ones, you know, they're, they're always trying to get in my shop when I'm making stuff, you know, and, and they're waiting, waiting for the day they can make their first knife. You know, right now I just let them play with like, you know, you can make a little wood knife or something. Um, but yeah, they're chomping on the bit and then they're drawing knives. They're like, dad, I made this new design. Look, <laughs> you know? So uh, yeah, when, excuse me, once they get up to age, they'll definitely be in the shop and I'll have to, you know, showing them some stuff. That's cool. Uh, but uh, there was something I wanted to say before um, oh, about about the period of time you're in where you can experiment, uh, but also um, it gives you also room to develop like the Thunderbird. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be uh, talking yeah. like I'm your agent or anything like that. But yeah, that because that that one seems to um, that one to me seems to be the kind of knife you could sell because it's each one is individual and special, but it's also uh, on, on a very, it's in a well traveled groove of worn cliffs of all different, you know, going way back to the sacks. People love worn cliffs and um, yeah, man, I don't know. I, I don't mean to go on and on about the Thunderbird. But, no, and and but, you're right. So that, I don't know if you ever saw that book, the war of art. Yeah. It's yes. a play on the name. Yeah. And, you know, I read that thing and I just felt like it was that process kind of, if you listen how he did it and how he talks about the muse, right. Yeah. And, and what do you have to do to get better, to make it is you have to do that every day, whether you feel like it, whether you're tired, whether you got time or you don't like, you have to make time and you have to do that every day. And when you do that, sometimes special things pop out, but that's the only way they pop out. It's not like you just, um, you know, you make knives part time and then you're going to hit it. Your design's perfect. It's like you have to get be in there every day, every day. And then something happens. Yeah. Um, and that's where I'm at right now. Uh, Andrew Pressfield uh, at fighting, fighting resistance is the is <laughs> that theme. And this is something I tell my daughters. It's like um, you can have talent and man, I hope you do have talent. Uh, but talent has to be cultivated and, and it does not preclude hard work. Like no matter how talented or not you are, you always have to work hard, period. Just hope that you're talented and that the hard work is channeled in a in a certain way. And and that's, you know, that's a, you know, you cannot rely on inspiration. That's another thing. Like, you know, that's the showing up every day. 90% of life is showing up, showing up every day and and plugging away, even when it sucks, even when you don't want to. And that's that's when stuff happens. Exactly. And that's, that's why I'm sacrificing because when I realized, okay, I've been doing it part-time for so long that, you know, I would only have times to do a random batch here and there, you know, for blade show or different shows I was doing, I wasn't cultivating that skill that way. Right. And it's not to, to going back to that book, the war of art, he would say the hobbyist, you know, the reason they're a hobbyist is because that's their excuse if they don't make it. Right. Your excuse for you don't make it is, oh, it's just kind of like my hobby, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they, he said, you'll you'll hide behind the fact like I love it so much. I don't want it to be work. Right. He goes. But, you know, the professional is the one who loves it that much because they they truly want to get better and they're at it every day and they're sacrificing. They might not ever make it right, but they're sacrificing and and they have faith in that process. And that's what I'm trying to live out right now. I'm trying to have some faith and just push myself every day and see where I can take this. Well, Macho, I, I couldn't think of a better way to, to wrap things up. That That's exactly the attitude you need, not just for starting a difficult venture like a knife company, but for anything day to day, you know, even if you're in only firewall from here on out, <laughs> so, you know, it's that approach that that will give you fulfillment. Thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast, sir. I really appreciate it. It was nice talking to you. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Don't take dull for an answer. It's the Knife Junkie's favorite sign-off phrase, and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise, like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long-sleeve tee, and more, even on coasters, tote bags, a coffee mug, water bottle, and stickers. Let everyone know that you're a Knife Junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. 
Get yours at theknifejunkie.com slash dull and shop for all of your Knife Junkies merchandise at theknifejunkie.com slash shop. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Eddie Macho Diaz of Macho Blades. I uh, can't wait to shake his hand at Blade Show in a couple of months. I didn't even ask him if he's going to be there, but I'm pretty sure he will be. And I can't wait to check out his knives in person. Um, I think we read some of the same books and uh, I, I really uh, resonate with his with his philosophy. So uh, I hope to see um, the Thunderbird in person. Uh, shortly and the predator and all these other beautiful knives uh, be sure to join us again next sunday for another interview and of course wednesday for the midweek supplemental where we talk about new knives in the market i do remember talking about the butcher and the shark tooth uh, about a year and a half ago on that show so tune in there and then of course thursday night knives 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on YouTube, also on Facebook and Twitch. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast mm-hmm.